title of my sermon this morning is The Minister's Liberty, Am I Not Free? The Minister's Liberty, Am I Not Free? A young preacher was invited to speak at his first conference next to a seasoned veteran. The elder preacher noticed how nervous the young man was. The older preacher said, Do not worry, my friend. God will provide. The younger preacher responded, But sir, you don't understand. I've never preached at a conference before. The older preacher responded, God will provide. The younger said, I was so, I was so nervous, I even forgot my Bible and sermon notes at home. I can't even remember a thing. The older preacher said, Here, take my Bible and remember, God will provide. So the younger preacher stood behind the pulpit and preached the most wonderful sermon with alliterated points and practical illustrations and applications. After which he stepped down to hand the Bible back to the older preacher who was beat red in the face. He, the older preacher said, young man, you stole my sermon notes for tonight. The younger preacher responded, God will provide. <laughs> you know, the commitment to full-time ministry is not an easy one, as Tab and I would both very clearly say. I mean, uh, on Monday, Labor Day, four years ago is when we packed all of our junk up in San Diego and we moved on up here. So this is probably technically my fourth, beginning of my fifth year is what I like to say, as your pastor. And, and it's truly a commitment is, is what I'm trying to get at. And in many different Christian denominations treat the ministers and the pastors within the church differently. This morning we're going to see what Paul has to say about the liberty or freedoms of the individuals who have chosen to give 100% of their lives into serving the Lord and, and the Christian people in, in ministry. But before we do, let's take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now for the chance you've given me to declare your word. Uh, inspire me and lead me, Lord. Allow me to declare it boldly and passionately. Allow me to serve you and you alone and, and, and speak of only what you want me to speak about through your word, Lord. I thank you and I praise you, I allow each and every one of us to be partakers of your word today and allow the, the points, the application to have, be influential to us as we make our way through our daily lives. In your name, amen. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So last week we studied through the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which talked about eating food that was sacrificed to pagan gods. Paul said, more or less, the Christians are at liberty to eat and drink whatever they want, as long as it doesn't cause another brother or sister in Christ to stumble in their faith. This week, as we move into chapter 9, we're going to look at Paul's thoughts and liberties, or the thoughts on the liberties and freedoms of himself and his fellow apostles and ministers. The application this week, I think, is very clearly pointing towards everyone serving in ministry, as in the individuals who have given 100% of their lives, I, I try not to say full-time, because it isn't full-time, it's 100% of their lives, no matter what it is, because you know, even full-time is not a good way to describe what we are called as pastors and ministers to do. But what I'm trying to say is that Paul is uh, going to tell us what these liberties are for the pastors and ministers of the Lord. So let's begin by getting a context and looking at the first two verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. The apostle says, he writes, I am I not free? Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship. So Paul begins, like the way my sermon is titled, Am I not free? This question that Paul is asking, is going to, he's going to address it pretty much throughout the rest of my text and into all of the ninth chapter. But more specifically, the rest of my text up to verse 14, Paul is going to answer this question. The Greek word used here for free is a form of the adjective eleutheros, which means freeborn in the sense of slavery, like literally the sense of someone who is enslaved. It means, this word means to be born free. Someone who is not enslaved to someone else. Free, exempt, unrestrained. Unrestricted is another word I guess we can use. Not bound by any obligation. What Paul is saying is that I am free. I didn't say this before, but each of these questions, he's going to say four questions in this beginning part. And they're all rhetorical questions, meaning the answer is yes. So the answer is yes, I am free. The next question he says is, am I not an apostle? Am I not an apostle? Paul answers this question with his final two questions in this beginning little introductory section. 
as well as what he says in verse 2, the, the statement he makes in verse 2. First of all, he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? This question tells us exactly what an apostle is. Someone who is an apostle is someone who has witnessed the resurrected Jesus Christ. Paul had a physical interaction with Jesus, who was directly responsible for his salvation and conversion to Christianity while on the road to Damascus. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus with the authority from the temple in Jerusalem to go and persecute the Christians there. And Jesus said, "Ah, uh -uh, I have a different plan for you. So he was entering Damascus with the goal of killing them, and he was leaving Damascus in the goal of leading them to Jesus, in, in the, with the goal of saving them. And here's a very truth, a, a kind of biblical truth right here. There's a lot of people that call themselves a lot of different things, bishops, all these different things, right? There are no apostles alive today. I don't care what they say, I don't know who, care what they've seen. They might have dreamed about Jesus. Just because you have a dream of Jesus doesn't mean you have a physical interaction with the risen Lord. Paul had a physical interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul didn't have a dream and see Jesus. There are an apostle is someone who has witnessed the resurrected Christ. It doesn't matter what I say, I am not an apostle. I will never be an apostle. All the apostles are dead, they're in heaven, they're gone. It's over. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus' ascension before the day of Pentecost, but before the day of Pentecost. So after his ascension, but before the day of Pentecost, we're looking at 40 days after he was risen from the grave, he ascended to heaven, 10 days following that, 50 days after he, uh, he was risen from the grave. So in this 10 day period of time, this event took place. In Acts chapter 1, Peter gives one qualification. Let me back up. In Acts chapter 1, Peter is going to appoint, the, the apostles are going to appoint a replacement for Judas. And that replacement is going to end up being the face. In Acts chapter 1, Peter gives one qualification that the man who they're going to use as a replacement for Jesus needs to have. And through the context of the passage, we see a second qualification. So let's look at the passage. Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So the two, two uh, qualifications, really you can say three. Peter, for the, the role that he was looking for, they were looking for someone who had been with them as a group. From the moment Jesus was baptized until his resurrection. That whole period of time. Until he was actually not even ascended to heaven. So, the, so really that's a qualification. But I would say that qualification was more specific for being a part of the twelve apostles. I mean Paul was not, he doesn't fit in that category. But the other one he said and the one I'm pointing out is that the man must be a witness of the resurrected Christ. And I want to say I'm emphasizing in the flesh. It's, it's specifically in the flesh. And the second qualification that we can gain from the context of the rest of the, uh, of the story is that this apostle needs to be called by God. If you know the rest of the story, there were two individuals up for consideration that were presented before the, the entire group of apostles. The two men were put forth. Um, they were Joseph, called Bar, um, Bar Sabas, who was also called Justice, and then again Matthias, who eventually became the apostle. Now you might think, well, they spent hours and hours in prayer, Trying to decide which one of these men was the right choice. That's not what they did. They rolled dice. They, they casted lots. And they said, Who, you know, he got the short straw. He wins. And, and, and I, to me, I've always wondered, why would they do that? Isn't there a better way to do it? And from a church perspective, we don't ever do it that way. I wish we did. The point is here that Matthias was the one called by God. No one can say he wasn't. He was the one who drew the short lot or whatever. I don't even know how they do lots. How he was the one who, who won the, the whatever the competition thing was, the, the casting of lots. Paul was a witness of the resurrected Jesus as well. Like I've already said, he, he came to know Christ. Jesus actually called him to himself. It was Jesus who led Paul to Christ. Paul was called into ministry and his apostleship through the Lord Jesus as well. So to be an apostle, you need to have witnessed the resurrected Christ and you need to be called by Christ. The Greek word apostle literally means one called. Now, moving on to the next question. So, again, the, the, uh, I said two questions and then that statement in verse 2 that he's uh, answering the question about whether or not he should be an apostle. And, again, the context is that, the, that some within Corinth were questioning this. Some within the church might have even been questioning this as well. He says, again, in verse 1, Are you not my work in the Lord? An additional proof of Paul's apostleship was the fruit of his labor, the fruit of his work, the Corinthian Christians. 
I would say that the proof of my success as a pastor has nothing to do with what I do, it's all what God does, but it would be the, the, the spiritual and physical growth that takes place. What we do. I mean, for me, the most important thing I can do is seeing you guys grow, you all grow spiritually. That's all that, that's my job as a minister. And sometimes I don't feel very successful. Sometimes I, I, there are some people that are just like, oh, maybe I'm not doing a very good job. But then, you know, the point is, I'm not the one judging. God's judging. God is my judge. Paul was saying, look at the change that has taken place in your lives. Isn't that enough proof that I have been called by God? The work of any minister is always done in the Lord. I might have labored over you. And my work at this church might have, might have been attributed at least a little bit um, to, from my own work. It might be, my work at this church might be, at least on, on the surface, the reason things have changed. With that in mind, the only reason to do it is for God. So I can't take any of the credit is the point. Then finally in verse 2, not finally, but in verse 2, the, before I really get to the point of my sermon. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship. To me, it seems very clear that at least some within the church were questioning this. You know, how are you possibly an apostle? You weren't there in the beginning. You weren't there during the whole time. How are you an apostle? And Paul's like, well, just look at what I've done. I mean, and how could you guys honestly be turning away from it now? You know, I mean, trust the Lord and, and continue um, seeking what you're called to seek. Look at verse 3 now as we get ready to, like, this is really the point of my sermon here. Verse 3. My defense to those who examine me is this. My defense to those who examine me is this. So Paul is about to defend himself against the accusations and the questions about his freedom as a minister and his freedom in his apostleship. In making this defense, he is also defending all who are in ministry and, and, and the freedoms that these individuals have. So, in, coming, in the coming verses, Paul is going to make an additional, he's going to ask an additional three questions. The first, the first two questions he's already answered in chapter 7 and 8. And then the final question is answered in the rest of chapter 9. So three questions, my three points. Point number one, question number one, do we not have a right to eat and drink? Again, we's referring to ministers. Do ministers not have a right to eat or drink? Well, Paul's already answered this, but let's look at it. Uh, well, I mean, I guess I already read the verse pretty much. Uh, verse 4 says exactly what my question says. What we do, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Paul addressed this last week. We talked about this last week. Paul tells us that we all have the right to eat and drink as we choose, as long as what we eat and drink don't cause someone to stumble in their faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours, again, the liberty and the freedom to eat and drink as you choose, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. The Greek word used here in eight, um, chapter 8, verse 9, translated liberty, so you see it there, um, is the same Greek word translated right in chapter, throughout chapter 9. So looking back at verse 4, do we not have the right? Same Greek word. Same has the similar Greek meaning here. It has the meaning of power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases, or freedom. Like, do I not have the freedom to eat what I choose to eat? I mean, what Paul is saying in verse 4, and again, what he will be saying in other contexts throughout the rest of the, the chapter, is that he has the freedom to eat and drink as he wishes. But, as we already know, we don't want to be a stumbling block either. And it's even more so. We're going to hit at, hit at this at the end of my sermon, and this is my sermon next week. It's even worse for a minister to be a stumbling block. We can't be a stumbling block. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, like we read last week, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Ministers in Christ have the freedom, the same freedom that other Christians have when it comes to eating and drinking. But like other Christians, and maybe even more so, Christian ministers need to make sure that their actions are not sinful and are not being a stumbling block for another Christian. Bottom line. Question number two. Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? Look at verse 5. Paul says... Like I just said, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? So pastors and ministers for Christ have the right to get married and be married. Paul emphasizes this. Um, he emphasizes, though, that the wife needs to be a Christian wife. That's the point. I mean, a pastor shouldn't go marry a pagan wife. A pastor shouldn't go marry someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. This doesn't work. 
We also saw that at the end of chapter 7 where Paul is talking to the widows and telling the widow who wants to remarry that she should marry a Christian man. And then, of course, vice versa with the widower marrying a Christian woman. Paul had the right to get married, but again, it seems very clear that he had chosen not to, that he is also has the right not to get married. He has the right to choose to remain celibate. In the rest of verse 5, Paul gives the rest of the apostles, meaning the other, uh, what am I thinking, I guess other 11, not including Cephas, Peter, who he's going to mention separately, as well as the other individuals who fall into that category. Again, you don't need to be one of the 12 to fall into the category of apostle. We see this in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says a large number of people witness Christ. Paul, again, Paul falls into that other category of apostles. So all of the other apostles, most of them have spouses as well. They're married. Then Jesus' brothers, again, Jesus' brothers include James, the author of the book of James, as well as Jude, the author of the book of Jude in the New Testament. The brothers of Jesus are married. James was the leader of the, of the Jerusalem church. If he's married, why in the world shouldn't everyone else be allowed to get married? And then, of course, the one that uh, most people like to point out is Peter. Peter was married. And this is interesting because, uh, again, the Roman Catholic Church would say that Peter was the first pope, and that the pope's not allowed to get married. So this kind of gives them a bit of, I, I have some questions for the pope, I guess, is, the, is my point. Peter, uh, let's see, this is also verified through the fact that Peter had a mother-in-law. If we look at Matthew chapter 8, we'll read about how Jesus healed Peter's sick mother-in-law. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think one of the major qualifications of having a mother-in-law is having a wife. Just a thought. I mean, I don't actually know a lot of people who would want a mother-in-law without having a wife. <laughs> okay, now I'm in trouble. Okay, Paul talked about this in depth again in chapter 7. He told the Corinthians in chapter 7 that marriage was good, yet remaining celibate, meaning remaining single, and refraining from sex, it was even better. But if you could not handle that, he said, you know, if you cannot control your sexual lusts and passions, then you should get married. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, Marriage is to be held in honor among all men, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, will, um, God will judge. And then Proverbs 18, verse 22, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Really, the point here is this, that a minister is allowed to do this. A minister for Christ is allowed to be married or allowed not to be married. They don't have to be married. They don't have to remain celibate. With this in mind, I think it's very important that, that they live a godly life as well. It's very quick and very easy for anyone to stumble away from what they believe and stumble in their faith. And we can't do that. And it's, again, such, a, such an essential part of all of this is that a pastor needs to live above reproach and how quickly it would be a, you can be a stumbling block for other people. Question number three, and here's the big one. Do we not have the right to be compensated for our work? Do we not have the right to be compensated for our work? Look at verse 6 all the way down to 14. And we're going to finish off my text today. Or do, not, or do only Barnabas and I have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I am not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say that these, say these things? For, if, for it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake. It was written, Because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, it, it, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, or this, uh, if others share the right over you, do not do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right. We, but we endured all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to eat, or to get their living from the gospel. So a bunch of stuff going on here. I mean, not really a bunch of stuff. I mean, Paul, he begins by saying, you know, is Barnabas and himself only, like, are they the only ones allowed not to work? As in not to work on the side and, and be provided for through the gospel. And of course, Paul's answer is by no means. People have people who have been given all given, I mean I can't even speak now. 
people who have been, who, people who have given all of their lives to ministry in, uh, for Christ should be compensated for doing so, is really the point. I'm distracted by Cameron. Then Paul gives eight examples or illustrations, is, is how I'm going to call this. It's kind of, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how you want to do it. It's just eight pieces of proof. The first one was of a soldier. A soldier doesn't go off to war, war and work for free. The soldier goes and he works. The soldier, does, you know, he gets paid for doing what he's doing. The next one was a planter. A planter eats what he planted. Imagine working all, working all summer long, all spring and summer long, on a garden, and then giving it all away, not eating any of it, not partaking in any of that fruit. It just doesn't work. A shepherd eats the meat and drinks the milk of the flock he is shepherding. He partakes in it. He doesn't do it for free. He gets something out of it. In verse 9, Paul says that these words he is speaking is not just him speaking. They actually come from Scripture. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. And this is really uh, example number four and five. Example four being it's from Scripture. A piece of evidence from four, it's from Scripture. And five is the, the example of the muzzle on the ox. An, an ox that is uh, threshing, meaning he is separating the edible parts of the grain from the inedible. In doing this, you're not going to muzzle the ox. The thought here is this ox is doing all the work. If you put something on its face, it can't get down and have a snack. I mean, some of that grain might be edible. The dogs seem to think the grass tastes good. So I, the, the same thing with this ox. The, the ox wants a little something to eat. Help him continue going. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't muzzle the ox. You would probably not go to work if, you, if I told you that you're not getting paid to do so. I mean, I'm just not 100% sure. But I'm pretty sure Tabitha won't drive to Quincy and work at, at Plumas County Mental Health if she is not going to get paid to do so. It just doesn't work that way. In verse 11, Paul's, uh, Paul's work, like so many who have entered into vocational ministry, is to sow the spiritual into those he is ministering to. Is it not too much to ask for material support in return? And then verse 12, the first half of verse 12, uh, before Paul goes on a slight detour, he says, you know, in the first part of verse 12, Paul points out the fact that the Corinthians had supported other ministers, and these other ministers are probably Apollos as well as Peter. In verse 13, we're going to hear a minute. Uh, I'm going to point out that Paul is also ex is kind of giving the example of the pagan priests and the Jewish priests who benefited from, uh, from the service they were doing as well. They were being compensated. The second half of verse 12, uh, Paul points out that Barnabas himself have chosen not to exercise this right. They have not taken this right to be compensated from the Corinthian Christians. Of course, Paul was a tent maker by trade and provided for himself. But he also received compensation from other people, other sources. For example, the Philippian church. But in this context, he has chosen not to. This is from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Had he been materially recompensed for his ministry, some might have presumed he was simply another itinerant in, educator motivated by prophets and would have refused him a hearing. To avoid being a stumbling block to any, Paul relinquished his right to receive support from those whom he was ministering, again, in this context. And then, like I said, verse 13, if you look at verse 13, you would see that Paul's also pointing to the Jewish temple and the pagan temples. These individuals who worked in those temples are partaking in the meat that they're sacrificing. The Jewish people were being provided for, the Jewish priests and the Jewish Levites were being provided for, as the priests were in the pagan temples as well. And then verse 14 really summarizes all of that. He gets to his point again. He says, the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. This is loosely taken, and most people believe this was loosely taken, and it is, he's saying the Lord directed, and specifically if we look at Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, we'd see the story of Jesus sending out the 12, and then Jesus sending out the 20. In these instances, in these, uh, in these uh, I don't know what you want to call them, stories, Jesus instructed the disciples to take nothing with them, take no provisions with them, and to accept the goodwill of those people they are ministering to. In Luke chapter 10, verse 7, uh, the, Jesus says, Stay in that house, eating and drinking with on what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his labors or his wages. There are so many Christian denominations and ways of thinking that say the pastor should work for free. In a similar way that I think Tabitha probably wouldn't drive down to Columbus County Mental Health for him. I don't know if I'd get up here and preach for free either. I don't know. I probably would. I have. I believe Paul refutes this belief, though is my point. I believe Paul clearly says that there's nothing wrong with receiving compensation um, from the ministry. This is not saying, like I said, it's not saying that I won't work for free or that other pastors won't work for free. 
I mean, there are scenarios where that, that, that allows it to take place. And if you look at Paul, that's exactly what took place. What this is saying is that the congregation needs to make it their goal to support the minister materially so that that minister can freely serve them and serve the Lord without hindrance. Let me close up. So those in full-time ministry receive the same liberty that any other Christian gets. Christians have a lot of freedom in Christ, but as we focused on last week and as we're going to focus on in the future, we need to do our best to avoid being a stumbling block. And this is such a, an, an extremely important principle for pastors and ministers as well. A minister who's a stumbling block is so much worse than just your typical Christian. If I'm a stumbling block to you, how much more of an effect is that going to have on the church, on Christian people? Being a stumbling block could come because of a simple mistake, but also could be a, a specific a sinful behavior taking place that one has chosen to partake in. When a pastor sins and causes his flock to stumble, this is again an even worse situation. A Pennsylvania youth pastor lost his job and was arrested on statutory sexual assault charges when it became apparent that the 15-year-old girl that he was having an affair with was pregnant. 35-year-old Wesley Blackburn got in trouble when he decided that it was a good idea to tell his wife that he was leaving her for the 15-year-old girl. The wife then brought this information to the church's pastor, the pastor of a Faith Brethren Bible Church in New Paris, Pennsylvania, located about 100 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. On, to, on October 6 of 2016, Blackburn, the, sadly the father of five with one on the way, uh, was arrested and charged with one account of corruption of minors and 84 accounts each of statutory sexual assault and indecent assault. It, it's, it's such a sad thought. It, it's beyond sad that this kind of stuff happens, but it does. And, we, and, and it's one of those things you've got to fight against. And as Christians, we need to fight against. Or you need to fight against this, the different temptations to sin that we have. But how much more is it so? How much more is it true of a minister? I mean, what did this dude do to his church, let alone the other people in this community? You know, it's such a horrible thought. The point there is that all Christians need to live above reproach, but this is especially true of pastors and ministers um, and ministry leaders. It is sad to think of the number of people who have walked away from God because of the actions of a preacher, because of the actions of a pastor. Our actions have consequences, and most of the time those consequences affect others. Think before you act. Remember those around you who might be affected by your actions and live life like Jesus. Bottom line, let me close with some prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I praise you and I thank you now once again. Bless us as we uh, get ready to depart. Allow this message to settle upon our hearts, Lord. Uh, allow us to appreciate all of those who are serving in, in, in any different way. As, as ministers, as full-time pastors, as people who have committed 100%, but also the other people, Lord. There's a lot of people I'm very thankful for at this church. There are many people that have stepped up and have done some amazing things that allow us as a church to continue to grow. I ask now that you bless us as we serve you, Lord. Bless me as the pastor. Allow me to have uh, just the encouragement I need to serve you in, in, a, in a way that is just one that focuses on you and one that's of encouragement, Lord. I thank you for all that you've done. I ask that you bless all the people who are serving you, Lord. There are people that are serving you for free in, in places ac across this world because of the desire to tell others about you. So, Father, I thank you for them. I thank you for our missionaries. I thank you for all that have uh, given so much for you and for your kingdom, Lord. I ask that you help us continue to give to you and to give back to you uh, of, of all that you've done for us. We thank you. We praise you in your wonderful name. Amen.